was in 1961 that humans first achieved spaceflight. In all the millions of years of human evolution, as far as we know, that was the first time that we escaped Earth's gravitational pull. And as the trips became longer with time, doctors noticed that prolonged periods of weightlessness had a very strange effect on the human body. Muscles wasted away, bones lost density, even the heart shrank. In fact, the body seemed to fall apart without gravity. I started to talk about the immune system with this anecdote because it illustrates an important rule. And the rule is evolution turns the unavoidable into the necessary. A body that evolved under the constant pull of gravity ends up requiring gravity to stay healthy. And we didn't fully appreciate this until we escaped Earth's gravitational pull. We're now learning something very similar about the immune system. The immune system needs its version of gravity. And in this case, gravity consists of things we've traditionally thought of as, as evil, uh, microbes, some microbes, certain parasites, I'll get to them in a minute. But the key thing that I want to emphasize now is that we may be living in a kind of immunological weightlessness and aspects of our immune system may have atrophied. And that weakness may explain our baffling vulnerability to diseases like asthma and hay fever and worse. I became inter interested in this question, as you heard, uh, because I've had lifelong allergies and asthma. When I was 11, I was struck by an autoimmune disease called alopecia areata, where my immune system turned against my hair follicles, leaving me mostly hairless. So I had one disease where I overreacted to proteins in the environment, and I had one disease where my immune system turned on me. What was wrong with my immune system? Um, I never got a good answer to that question. And 20 years later, as a science writer, as a journalist, I decided to look into it again. I did not discover a cure, as you can see, but I did come upon a kind of revolution in our understanding of our own biology, which is what I'm here to tell you about. The first clue was simply that I was not alone. These diseases were more and more common. Allergies and asthma increased between two and threefold in the late 20th century, and depending on the autoimmune disease, they increased, it could have increased by even more. Scientists use the word epidemic to describe these trends, as in an epidemic of asthma, an epidemic of allergies, an epidemic of autoimmunity. But not everyone was equally vulnerable to the epidemic. In fact, affluence was a very good predictor. The richer your country, the more likely you were to have one of these diseases. And in the developing world, where there was a greater spread of experiences, the higher your social class, the more likely you were to have one of these diseases. In fact, the more your world was like the world of the past, the less likely you were to have one of these diseases. And that meant exposure to lots of people, exposure to animals, exposure to mud, and exposure to feces. So I'll illustrate with an example. The border between Russia and Finland bisects a region historically known as Karelia. Since the end of World War II, Half of Karelia ended up in what was then the Soviet Union and half in Russia, the other half in Finland. Finland is among the richest countries in the world per capita. That area of Russia is very poor. Finland has the highest prevalence of type 1 diabetes in the world. That's an autoimmune diabetes that's usually childhood onset. When you cross the border, it's one-fifth as prevalent. Celiac disease is one-fifth as prevalent. Allergic disease are one-fourth as prevalent. Now, these values aren't due to lack of diagnosis. They come from objective studies. And um, they're not due to genetics. Both populations are related. They're not due to sunlight. Both populations live in the same latitude. They get the same amount of sunlight. They get to have the same amount of vitamin D. And in the case of celiac, it's not due to different patterns of wheat consumption. In fact, the Russians eat more wheat than the Finns. So what's protecting them, right? Well, they're poor. They more often drink water that's not treated. And they more often have orofecal infections, like hepatitis A and Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a bacterium that's famous for causing stomach cancer and ulcers. But now, increasingly, scientists think that it protects against asthma and other inflammatory diseases. But more generally, on the Russian side, they just seem to be exposed to microbial wealth, a kind of microbial rainforest that's just absent on the Finnish side. And their immune system works differently as a result. This kind of observation has been made many times before. Other environments that are enriched with microbes, that have this microbial rainforest, often seem to protect against allergic disease. If you go to a daycare early in life, you have a lower chance of asthma later, it's often observed. If you have a pet early in life, especially a dog, lower risk later. 
If you're born into a big family with lots of older brothers who are making everything, or ancestors, making everything dirty for you, your risk of asthma and allergies is less later. And then there's something called the farm effect. We tend to think that uh, allergies began as a phenomenon, the epidemic in the mid 20th century, but actually, allergies first emerged as hay fever among the upper classes of Britain and the United States in the 19th century. We know this because they bragged about it, since it seemed like they were the only ones that wheezed and sneezed. Wheezing and sneezing became a kind of badge of honor and civilization and refinement. Even then, they noticed that farmers never seemed to get hay fever. And that was very strange, because farmers were exposed to just about more pollen than anyone else. So scientists rediscovered this phenomenon in the 1990s in Switzerland, the small alpine farms. They found that kids who grew up on farms were about one-third as allergic as kids who were just down the road in rural areas who weren't farming. It wasn't any old farm. It was farms with animals, farms with cows especially, farms where they drank raw milk, and at the end, they looked at the microbes. It was farms with the greatest diversity of microbes that were the most protective. Now, exposure, the timing of exposure was important. Kids who were born to mothers who worked in the cow shed while they were pregnant and then who loved their, their infants along for chores were the least allergic out of everyone. And scientists could actually see when they were born that these kids had a different kind of immune system already at birth. Their immune system was much more able to restrain itself and hold back and not overreact, not to do what, what my immune system does when I eat a peanut, for example. Um, so let's go back to the opening mantra, which was, evolution turns the unavoidable into the necessary. It doesn't take a huge stretch of the imagination to see that this environment more resembles the environment that we evolved in than a clean apartment in Madrid or New York. So the question is, does our immune system actually anticipate some of those signals? And if, if so, can we actually replace them? And actually, scientists find they can take microbes from the cow shed and spray them on pregnant mice, and the mice have little pups that are very protected against allergy. So what we have here is a kind of future probiotic. It's not, no one's selling it yet, but for the future, that, that prevents allergy from ever occurring. And it raises an interesting question. What else is missing? Remember those kids in, in the Russian, in Russian Karelia? They have that Helicobacter pylori. We all used to have Helicobacter pylori maybe 150 years ago. Now about 5% of kids do in the developed world. That happened without our even noticing. And a lot of people would say that's a great thing since it may cause cancer. Uh, but if it helps our immune system calibrate itself, then the question is what else are we, are we losing out on? An easy answer to that are parasites. These are large, gross worms that we'd rather not think about. But if you evolved on planet Earth, the fact of the matter is you were parasitized, probably. They're ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. Whales have them, chimps have them, the dinosaurs have them, even parasites have parasites. And all the evidence suggests that humans were parasitized until very recently, pretty acutely. Parasites pull off a trick. They convince you they, they live for years, first of all, inside another animal, sometimes decades. They do that by convincing you that they belong. And they convince you they belong by suppressing your immune system. So imagine you had this constant immune suppression for thousands, maybe millions of years, and then you suddenly removed it. Well, you'd end up with a hyper-reactive immune system. And I'm going to illustrate this with another story. In the early 2000s, Economic turmoil struck Argentina, and a few multiple sclerosis patients there showed up with parasite infections. That neurologist who was tending to them understood what I just said about parasites. He understood they suppressed the immune system. He thought maybe it would actually help with this autoimmune disease. So he gave them a choice. I can deworm you, or I can leave the parasites, and we'll see what happens. Twelve decided to keep the parasites. Now, multiple sclerosis is a very serious disease. It's your immune system turning against your central nervous system, sort of eating holes in it. And a creeping paralysis occurs that, in extreme cases, ends up with death. So what happened was pretty remarkable. The frequency of new exacerbations, these are periods of dizziness and weakness, slowed down dramatically. The appearance of new lesions in the brain that show up as like dark spots and MRIs, they slowed down as well. In fact, the parasites brought the disease to an almost complete halt. Five years later, some of them weren't feeling so hot with their parasites, and they asked to be dewormed. He dewormed them. The disease started right back up again. 
Now, this is not how we like our science to be done. It's not placebo-controlled and randomized. But actual placebo-controlled studies on children in the tropics show that when you deworm a bunch of kids, you get an immediate increase in allergic reactivity. So none of this really means that parasites are completely benign. They're clearly stealing something from you. If they, if they weren't, they wouldn't be parasites. But remember the mantra, evolution turns the unavoidable into the necessary. If we evolve with this constant pressure on our immune system, might it be that our immune system actually needs parasites present to work optimally? There's one more piece of the puzzle to what may have gone wrong Huh, a lot of slides there. Um, may have gone wrong with our immune system. It is called the human microbiota. These are the microbes that live inside of us. Right now in your body, microbes outnumber your cells by a factor of 10 to 1. That means you are actually 10% human and 90% microbe in certain respects. Most of these microbes live in your gastrointestinal tract, and most of your immune activity happens around your intestines as well about 70%, which means that what lives inside of you may have a great effect on how your immune system works. Now here, my gravity metaphor sort of falls apart. This is not a force acting upon you. This is more like a symbiosis. These things synthesize vitamins for you. They protect you from invaders. And in return, you give them a place to live and you feed them. So it's a little troubling that it seems that our community of microbes in the developed world, when you compare it to people who live in more traditional ways, it seems to be impoverished. We have lost diversity relative to people who live in these kinds of conditions. Now, as you remember, diversity was good back in Russian Karelia, diversity was good on the farm. Why are we losing diversity? It may just be that we haven't inherited our microbes. It may also be that our diet isn't doing us any favors. The Western diet is high in unhealthy fats and simple sugars and low in complexity. And it seems like that kind of diet acts kind of like what happens with a marine dead zone, where you have all this fertilizer washing down the river, and it hits the ocean, and it causes a kind of collapse in the ecosystem. Another reason may be antibiotics. There's this troubling correlation when you use a lot of antibiotics early in life. Your risk of asthma and some other diseases that I'm talking about goes up. So you think this is reverse causation. That's because people who are destined to get these diseases are sickly early in life to begin with. But the problem is scientists find that they can give antibiotics to mice, knock out key subsets of their microbes, and increase the risk of these diseases later. Those microbes they knock out soothe your immune system, and they help you control yourself, not overreact. In fact, everything I talked about, all these things through various ways and means help your immune system hold back. And so what's remarkable is that we haven't changed just one of them in the last 150 years. We've actually changed them all. We've left the farms, we've moved to the cities, we've paved the roads, we've sterilized our water, sterilized our food, which used to be very fermented on top of being filthy, and we've changed our diet and also taken antibiotics. We did a lot of this for extremely good reason, to stop dying from infectious disease, but it may be that in trying to get rid of the things that were killing us, we also got rid of some of the things that were keeping us well, and they're not necessarily the same things. So, what are we gonna do about this? Well, nothing right now. Actually, people should ask me about stories. I'll tell you stories later, but we're not gonna do anything officially right now. And the way I like to answer this question is by thinking about a doctor 20 years from now. Now, these days, doctors tend to ask, what's behind thus and such symptom? What's causing this set of problems? But everything I just talked about may result in something missing from an absence. So the future doctor is going to ask, what's missing? Can I replace it? The emphasis, in general, is going to be on disease prevention. And that project for the disease prevention is going to begin with your parents before you're born. Remember those kids that were born with a different immune system on the farm. What are they going to use? Are they going to use domesticated parasites? Are they going to just add and subtract members to your, from your, your microbiota? Are they going to have drugs that are derived from these things? Are they going to use fecal transplants, which are exactly what they sound like? Ask about those too later. We don't know yet. It's very unclear. But what's more important at this point is simply acknowledging the reimagining of the immune system that this approach entails. We've historically thought of the immune system as a kind of army with a defensive line, something approaches, and boom, goodbye, but clearly it's much more co complicated. It's more like a sensory organ that's constantly sensing what's there. It's more like 
a diplomatic core. It strikes up relationships with other organisms. It's more like a brain, actually, that learns and remembers. And like the brain in your head, it needs a good education. Otherwise, it develops bad habits. So the future doctor is going to educate your immune system. It's possible that everything I just said is not true. I have to just acknowledge that. I'm a science writer. I think some of it is. I think a lot of it is. So I think there's probably a lot more at stake here than just allergies and autoimmune disease, if it's true. Humanity recently passed a milestone. We're now more likely to die from a non-infectious disease than an infectious disease. These diseases include cardiovascular disease, some cancers, dementia, and they're all linked to type 2 diabetes and obesity. And they all share, as a collection of diseases, often called the diseases of civilization, a core feature, often, of inflammation, of, a disease, of, a, of an immune system that just won't shut off. Now, is this pure coincidence? Probably not, which means that this future doctor is going to have a very powerful tool to prevent, to address the diseases of civilization. The irony is this tool is going to involve going to our ancestral past, replacing some of these stimuli, some of these inputs, so that we can go forward to a new kind of future. And it all begins with a simple rethinking, this reimagining of the immune system in its proper evolutionary context. And here's what I mean. Let's go back to those astronauts. Let's imagine that you are some kind of space alien doctor that evolved in outer space and went to medical school in outer space, and all you've ever known is weightlessness. You come to those astronauts, you see that they have bloated faces and wasted bodies and brittle bones, and you say, what kind of space virus is causing this problem? You take all your intergalactic technology and throw it at answering that question. Now imagine that you are on planet Earth, you're looking up at the problem, you're aware that human beings have evolved on planet Earth. You'd have a very different take. You would say, there's nothing causing that. There's one thing missing, gravity. They need to be rescued from weightlessness. Bring them home, and all those symptoms will resolve. Thank you.